Welcome to this special podcast episode of Diabetes Care on Air. I'm Dr. Michael Rickles from the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm Dr. Alice Chang from the University of Toronto. In this episode, we will cover the content of the Diabetes Care Symposium presented at the ADA Scientific Sessions in June 2023 on social determinants of health in the development of diabetes and related papers that were published as part of the September issue of Diabetes Care. Joining us for this important discussion are Drs. Stephanie Fitzpatrick and Seth Berkowitz. Dr. Fitzpatrick is an Associate Professor of Medicine in the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra University and in the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research at Northwell Health in New York and an Associate Editor of Diabetes Care. Dr. Berkowitz is an Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of General Medicine and Clinical Epidemiology at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. Welcome, Stephanie and Seth. We are so glad you could both join us for this. Thank you for having us. Happy to be here. Yeah, thanks so much. Appreciate the invitation. So Mike and I want to dedicate this episode to the memory of Dr. Felicia Hill Briggs, who died on June 23rd, the day before her recorded lecture was delivered in San Diego and kicked off the Diabetes Care Symposium on Social Determinants of Health and Development of Diabetes. Dr. Hill Briggs had moved from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine to the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra University and in the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research at Northwell Health in 2021, where she was a professor of medicine and the Simons Distinguished Chair in Clinical Research. Stephanie joined her there in mid-2022. Stephanie, could you please share a few words of remembrance about Felicia? Yes, thank you, Alice. Actually, I did my postdoctoral fellowship with Dr. Hill Briggs at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. And I think what I would share the most with everyone who knew Felicia or knew slightly of Felicia, that she was just a trailblazer in behavioral science and developing interventions and programs focused on diabetes, but also just health inequities in general and addressing those health inequities. And I remained in awe of her, certainly from postdoc on, as she became my colleague and really close friend, just to terms of how thoughtful she was in her work and how she could really break down a problem and come up with informed solutions, but she would bring you along on the journey when she would do that. And so certainly will miss her impact in this space. That's such a lovely remembrance, Stephanie. And your article with Felicia, and that we are so fortunate to have Felicia present in the symposium, provides an overview of social determinants of health in the development of diabetes. And specifically explains how education, occupation, and income cycle together with intergenerational racial inequities that drives higher diabetes incidence, prevalence, morbidity, and mortality. Stephanie, can you explain how these factors should be considered in a framework that's designed to change current policy to better promote diabetes prevention and management in the United States? Yes, thank you, Mike. So yes, in this paper, we particularly wanted to highlight how the World Health Organization Social Determinants of Health Framework really includes socioeconomic and political context or systems, as well as racism as upstream drivers of health inequities and how, unfortunately, the US-based Social Determinants of Health Frameworks do not include that sociopolitical context and racism. And so throughout the paper, we describe using Black and African-Americans as an example of how this cyclical, intergenerational, and population-based nature of social determinants of health are perpetuated in that you have the historical context of slavery, and you have a set of policies and practices that follow the Emancipation Proclamation, such as anti-literacy laws that prevented Black African Americans from learning how to read and write. You have Jim Crow laws, segregation laws, redlining, all of these that impact a population of people who then led to experiencing inequities in educational attainment and achievement, which led to higher likelihood of either being unemployed or having service type jobs that were low paid jobs, which led to low income and less wealth and less building of wealth in the community. And then all of that, that cycle, all of that right there 
then really impacts the community's access to safe and well-resourced neighborhoods, physical environments, and quality health care. And this continues for generations, leading to the disparities that we see in conditions like diabetes. And so when we start to think about and talk about these factors and the cycle at the population level as opposed to the individual level, we can start to think about legislation and policies and system changes that need to occur across all sectors and try to adapt approaches. We talk about the health and all policies approach, which is an approach that incorporates health and health equity considerations into decision-making across sectors and policy areas. Wow, that's a, a lot of information in there, but, but beautifully presented there, Stephanie, and really sort of makes us think about a, a great framework of how to try to put this together. Now, Seth, you spoke at the symposium on the topic of food insecurity and diabetes, which you also cover in your published commentary on the article collection, including the paper by Dr. Ron Lee Levi from the University of California, San Francisco, and colleagues that reviews this complex relationship. Can you take us through how food insecurity is linked to the development of diabetes, how failure of our distributive institutions contributes to food insecurity in the first place, and perhaps most importantly, what are some potential paths forward to address this? Sure. Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, it's a big topic, and I always joke that I try to dispel the notion that people from North Carolina speak slowly, so you might hear me sort of ramping up as I get into it. But although I think probably the audience here, everyone knows what food insecurity is at this point. When I started earlier in my career, that wasn't the case. And so I always like to start off just by sort of level setting there. And so I think of food insecurity as insufficient or unsecure access to the food needed for an active, healthy life. In the U.S., not everywhere in the world and not, you know, the case throughout human history, but in the U.S., it's primarily a problem of income with also some issues of transportation and neighborhood food access and things like that, but primarily an issue of income in the sense that if you have sufficient money, you can find a way to get food. I think it contributes to the development of diabetes in at least three key ways. One is certainly through diet or a nutritional pathway. And I think that's probably what's most salient and what springs to mind when you hear food insecurity. So we know, for example, that less nutritious foods are often cheaper on a per calorie basis than more nutritious foods. And so if you have pressure that's sort of pushing you to meet your calorie needs, but not necessarily the full set of your nutrition needs, then that could push you towards excess adiposity or foods that have a higher glycemic index and tend to raise the blood sugar and things like that. And so there's a pathway there. There's also, I think, an important pathway through trade-offs. So when you're food insecure, you're trying to make ends meet, you're trying to stretch every dollar. And so you might not be able to take care of your health in other ways. You might you know, have to put in extra time at work and not have time to exercise or things like that. And so you might make some trade-offs that influence diabetes risk. And finally, it's just a very stressful, aversive condition. And we know there are a lot of psychological pathways through activation of inflammation or neuroendocrine pathways and things like that, where you're in this situation of stress and maybe also experiencing anxiety or depressive symptoms, things like that, that I think contribute to diabetes. So there are a lot of ways that food insecurity gets you to diabetes. The sort of natural follow-up to the question then is, you know, well, how do you get to food insecurity? As I mentioned, it's sort of a question of income, at least to some extent, although I won't say that's the only factor. So then the question becomes, well, how does income get distributed? And this is one of those things that I think seems like sort of a simple answer at first, but is actually a little bit more complex. And so when I talk about distributive institutions, that might not be a super common term. It's not my term. It is used in some fields, but it might not be common in the medical or health fields. And those are sort of the patterns and practices and systems that distribute income or other material resources, and they exist in every society. The most common one is sometimes called the factor payment system. So if you think back to your Econ 101 days, the so-called factors of production were land, labor, and capital. And so the owners of each of those factors get some income. So you either work for the income, that's probably you know what is most salient and comes to people's mind, or maybe you own some land and people pay you rent, or you own a factory and, and you get profits from the factory or something like that. So that's sort of the factor payment system. And that seems like sort of the default way that income is distributed in the U.S., the issue, though, is like only about half of people in the U.S. actually get income directly through a factor payment, either through their work or through owning things. And, you know, before people sort of say, well, you know, the U.S. is just so lazy or something like that. Why is it only half? You actually have to think about where that is. So we think of, you know, say working age adults, people between the age of 18 and 65 or something like that. 
But that leaves people on other ends of that. So children up to age 18, they aren't working for a living. And that's a good thing. We consider that an advancement in our society that we don't have to send kids to the mines or anything like that. And then older adults after people retire are no longer working. And that in and of itself constitutes about 40% of the US population overall, the combination of children and older adults. And then within that working age category, you have people who are not working for what are sometimes called good reasons. So people who are attending school full time, you know, college and things like that so that they can work later. People who are unemployed, they're actively seeking work, but are temporarily between jobs. People who are disabled, people who are doing caregiving, which is sometimes unpaid, but socially necessary. We need it for society to function, raising children or caring for a loved one or something like that. And so that's another 10% overall of the population. So if you add that up, about 50% of the population doesn't get income through the factor payment system. So then the question is, all right, well, how do they get income? You have two other main options. One are what's called household transfers. So they might live with someone else in a household that pools resources and get money in that way. So my, my kids, I have a six-year-old and a three-year-old, and you know, they get their income comes through household transfers. Or you have what's called the tax and transfer system where sort of government distributes income in that way. And so you have transfer payments like a social security pension or the SNAP benefit or things like that. And so those three distributive institutions, the factor payment system, household transfers, and the tax and transfer system are kind of the main ways that you can get income. And so the answer to where food insecurity comes from is a breakdown in at least one of those three systems, because otherwise you would get sufficient income to people and, and they could afford enough food. And although I know this answer is kind of long, I'll just leave it by saying that those three distributed institutions and thinking about what the breakdowns of that are, are really what lead you into ideas of like, well, how can policy work to prevent food insecurity? Fundamentally, and there are lots of different ways to do this that may work well in different situations, but fundamentally, you need to address at least one of those three distributed institutions in order to get income to people who otherwise wouldn't have enough of it. And in particular, it tends to be people who aren't engaging with the factor payment system now. So children, older adults, people with disabilities. There's a statistic in the U.S. that about 75% of households in the U.S. that experience food insecurity have a member who's a child, experienced job loss in the past year, or has a work-limiting disability. So those categories are sort of the main ones that really lead households to experience food insecurity. And Seth, thinking about the trade-offs, as you described, I mean, I can't help but thinking, too, as clinician caring for patients with diabetes, we're often seeing trade-offs surrounding medications, monitoring supplies, things that are even testing other specialty appointments that we believe are necessary for their optimal care, but yet again, see trade-offs in what they can afford and how you know downstream of that is, I'm sure, the trade-offs in what we're recommending and, and is necessary for treating their condition medically is there's a trade-off in how the impacts of those costs are affecting their food insecurity or even making the, the money available for providing healthy nutrition even harder. The last article in the collection is by Dr. Mahasan Mujahid from the University of California, Berkeley, who presented at the symposium. And together with colleagues, the article discusses the impact of neighborhoods on diabetes risk and outcomes, and specifically how structural and institutional racism, and Stephanie, you, you touched on some of these aspects already, can lead to being key drivers for the development of neighborhood environments that can lead to neighborhood deprivation, poorly built physical environments, and concerns for safety that all contribute to diabetes risk. So Stephanie, turning back to you now, can you expand some more on this issue and, and how we may best address neighborhood deprivation and improve neighborhood factors using policies that might enable permanent structural change? Yes, certainly as Dr. Mujahid and colleagues point out, and I also want to just do a little shout out and call out to the 2020 Social Determinants of Health Systematic Review that was published in Diabetes Care led by Dr. Felicia Hill-Briggs. Seth was also a co-author on that phenomenal systematic review. But across both of these pieces of work here, they really cover the fact that where you live has an impact on your risk for diabetes, as well as how well you can manage your diabetes once you have it. And so thinking again about policies and systems, practices such as redlining, disinvesting in communities are unfortunately still occurring 
and they have implications for the type of resources that are provided in neighborhoods, both when you're talking about terms of built environments, in terms of sidewalks and grocery stores, but also in terms of safety, having police presence and making sure that people feel safe coming in and outside of their homes all has an impact on how people manage or either prevent diabetes. And so, and these practices, when I talk about redlining and some of these other kind of inequities or sociopolitical practices that end up or lead to inequities, even when those practices are eliminated or reduced, they have lasting effects, again, for generations, particularly in terms of diabetes mortality. There's an excellent paper also published in Diabetes Care in the August 2022 issue authored by Dr. Agedi and his colleagues that really looks at the relationship between past redlining practices and current present day diabetes mortality. We still see that significant relationship that's there. So I think certainly discontinuing these practices that impact built environment, physical environment, safety, neighborhood resources, and reinvesting in low-income communities could really help to lead to structural changes. And the paper that Felicia and I authored, we particularly give some examples about successful academic medical center or health system partnerships with community organizations and community members that involve job training, employment, sponsoring grocery stores and food pantries in the community and the neighborhood to address that food insecurity issue that Seth was just speaking about, also partnering with transportation companies so that community members can be able to get back and forth to medical appointments and have that access to quality care. And then also thinking about how community benefit dollars are utilized. That is dollars that come from the government that then are given to the hospital, hence the keyword community. Those dollars should be reinvested back into the community to enhance those existing strengths and assets that are there. So I think those are just a few examples that we provide in the paper of how they get at the neighborhood level, how we can impact and create some policies that have structural changes. You know, as, as I sit here and I listen to both you, Stephanie, and, and you, Seth, and I think about, you know, as, as a simple clinician, we're often focused on the biology of that individual and focused on medications and lab results. And sometimes we lose the big picture. And listening to the two of you, it's a a necessary reminder to at least me, a simple clinician, of how the big picture has a massive impact on not just the individual sitting in front of me at that moment in the clinic, but really everybody, right? The community, the society. And also sitting here in Canada, as I'm doing this, I, this is not just a U.S. problem by any means. I mean, we're lots of data coming from Canada as well about uh, postal codes and where one lives and the impact on various chronic diseases. So I certainly thank both of you for reminding me, the simple clinician, of uh, thinking big picture. Now, in February, Mike and I had the honor to host a special podcast episode on the National Clinical Care Commission report to Congress on prevention and control of diabetes. Now, this report, while published in the February 2023 issue of Diabetes Care, was issued to Congress in January 2022. And I encourage anyone who hasn't listened to that to certainly listen to that conversation with the report's authors. But one of the commission's foundational recommendations was to address social determinants of health, recognizing the importance of addressing inequities in food, housing, transportation systems as essential components to improving population level diabetes prevention and treatment. Now, Seth, turning to you, can you comment on the impact of this report on recognizing or addressing the issues of food insecurity and our built environment? Yeah, I think it's had a really important impact. And I mean, I have to say, I think one of the potentially positive developments to come either directly from the COVID pandemic or into sort of the post-pandemic era, I think is a really renewed attention to the importance of social determinants of health. And I think this report is a key example of it that, you know, that was a report to Congress. The White House recently just announced a national strategy on addressing social determinants of health, Healthy People 2030, which is our, you know, another sort of national population health guidepost or or strategy includes a lot of things there. And so I think work like these reports is really critical in raising awareness of the importance of social determinants of health. I think that's also a first step, though, because there, you know, it's one thing to say social determinants of health are important. It's something else to say, well, what are you going to do about them or what specifically should we do to address them? And there can be a danger in everyone just sort of agreeing abstractly, yes, social determinants of health are important, but but without sort of adding 
specificity of what really needs to be done to change them. And so one of the things I really liked about this report was it, it marshaled a lot of evidence around the you know, social determinants in the abstract. It gave very concrete recommendations as well. And I, and I think that is a really important thing to do. And I hope that scholars in the medical and population health and public health field, like Dr. Fitzpatrick and the other authors who wrote articles at these issue, I hope their voices are really lifted up because all of those articles had really important practical solutions for what to do to address these issues. Seth, that's great to hear about some of the practical steps that have been taken since the National Clinical Care Commission report to Congress. And great to hear that initiatives have come out of the White House now. And again, agree that it's been an important step in raising awareness to the importance of these factors for our population's health. And just to echo how important all of the work is that's being done by the authors and scientists who contributed to this Diabetes Care Symposium. And the last talk we had was from Dr. Michelle Albert from the University of California, San Francisco, who addressed the negative impacts of socioeconomic adversity and toxic adverse experiences on health outcomes. And so Stephanie, turning back to you, can you help us consider how we might be more sensitive to this biology of adversity in diabetes policy development and practice? Yeah, so I think it really starts with our frameworks. Again, do we actually acknowledge and recognize and call out that socioeconomic adversity and these toxic adverse experiences are part of the full picture when we're talking about inequities, particularly diabetes inequities, whether we're talking about prevalence and incidence or actual complications and access to care. And so we have to make sure that the context, again, that socio-political context, the racism, all of that has to be integrated into our frameworks to get a real full picture in terms of what people and communities are experiencing day to day and what increases their risk. And then the other thing I would say is, who's at the table when we are developing policies and practices? And so I think making sure that we put some effort behind having experts, whether that is through research, research experts, clinical practice experts, but particularly people with lived experience making sure that their voices are heard and that they are at the table when we are trying to make these policies and practice decisions as it relates to diabetes. And I'll just share again briefly, you know, Felicia awesomely represented all of those. She was a research expert, clinical expert, but she also lived with type 1 diabetes. And she was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at a really young age and at a time when there was still racial segregation in terms of healthcare access. And then as she grew up, still trying to manage with, again, certain practices, racist practices and policies, making it hard to access care, the care that she needed and the access to medications, et cetera, to manage her diabetes. And so, again, having those, those diverse voices at the table, I think really would bring us a lot further and progress would be made in terms of informing our policies and practices. Important words there, Stephanie, and, and thank you for our audience listening to this, I mean, there, there are going to be people from the very sectors that you just described. And I think, again, speaking on behalf of the simple clinician, the, the advocacy piece is, is, I think, something that we have not traditionally done as well and perhaps should do better. And I think your words will help and in, inspire that. So with that, Seth, Stephanie, final takeaway messages uh, for our listeners. Seth, perhaps we'll start with you and then we can go to Stephanie. So I just have two. One is an anecdote about Dr. Hillbriggs that I'll start with. And so as, as Stephanie mentioned, I was fortunate to get to work with her on the ADA's review of social determinants of health. And, you know, so I was sort of brought in specifically to work on the food insecurity section and, and you know, very graciously said, oh, you know, do this or whatever. We could really use your help on it and whatnot. As I got to talk to her, it was very clear that she did not, in fact, need to know, but she knew that literature extremely well. And then for every other section, she knew the literature and everything extremely well. And I probably could have done the whole thing um, herself, except she's extremely busy. And so she was very kind to bring other people in. But I just thought it was very inspiring to to work with someone who who obviously had such mastery of a complicated area. And it just became something that I, you know, kind of hope that I can can develop over time. The other thing that I'll, I'll just mention, although I'll say I, I do it a little bit sheepishly, is that I have a book coming out on some of these topics called Equal Care, 
And it's really meant for um, potentially people like those listening to this podcast, people who feel the importance of this area, but maybe this hasn't been the area that they themselves have investigated in or, or you know, haven't, haven't spent their careers in and things like that. And so it's meant to be a way to sort of lay out a lot of the ways that health and social policy affect health and what we might do to improve health through using health and social policy, but in a way to, you know, just kind of kind of introduce it to people who care about this topic, but maybe that hasn't been how they've spent their time. And in some ways, it's sort of the book, like what I wish I would have seen at the, you know, when I was in fellowship or in the beginning of my career or something like that. And so if people are interested in in these topics, and Dr. Chang, I think you elaborated nicely why it can be important for all of us, even if our day-to-day work is more clinical and removed from, you know, social policy or politics or things like that, we can still recognize the importance of these areas and just kind of think through, you know, the way our voice should be used to improve health for everybody. Thank you. And Stephanie? Any final takeaway messages for our listeners? Yeah, uh, a couple of things that I will say is one, I'm just really thankful for the opportunity, certainly through this podcast to share, you know, more about our paper, but also just to diabetes care in terms of being able to present this. When you say things like racism, it's controversial. People get a little uncomfortable, but, you know, one of Felicia's main goals with writing this paper is to say the things that often go unsaid, because that is how we start to move to and promote and advance health equity. And so we have to acknowledge sometimes that unfortunate, not very pretty, that blemish in our history and the long-term impact that it has had on certain communities and then in order to be able to move forward. And so just really thankful about being able to produce this paper and have it be shared widespread. But also just want to point out that this was the last piece of work that I was able to work on and complete with Dr. Hilbriggs before she passed. And so I'm really happy that we were able to get it done, get it published, and that she was able to record her presentation for the symposium. And I hope that for folks who have not been able to go and watch it, really encourage you to watch that because it is just an opportunity to see us, as Dr. Berkowitz referred to, as kind of this mastery of the literature of the issues, what's going on, and and how do we move forward, and really just to get a glimpse into her passion and her brilliance. Well, Stephanie and Seth, you both have done a tremendous job paying tribute to Felicia Hill Briggs, and I'm sure wherever she is now listening in on this can really appreciate how her work, her efforts, her inclusiveness, and in teaching and bringing folks together and bringing awareness of these important issues is really being carried on, certainly by the two of you and all of the contributors to the Diabetes Care Symposium and the article collection in the September issue. And Seth, it's great to hear about equal care and more vehicles for distributing this information so that all of us can have more access to improve our understanding of the issues and really work towards making diabetes prevention and management much more improved and equitable on a population level. And so on behalf of Alice and myself, I want to sincerely thank you, Stephanie, Seth, and all of your colleagues who contributed to the Diabetes Care Symposium and the article collection on social determinants of health in the development of diabetes. Your hard work and critical insights will undoubtedly have a major impact on the future of diabetes care. And I encourage all of our listeners to access and read the full articles in the September 2023 issue. And thank you for tuning in to this special podcast episode.